Welcome, friends, fight fans, to episode five of the Mystic Hour. Late, a little late, a little late, but we are here. There was a little game happening. Uh, Nick, I'm sure you were watching it. We are from South Florida, so we have yep. to watch the Miami Heat. I know this is an MMA podcast, but hey, it's all free for sports. That was a great game. I'm, I'm just, you know, sipping the champagne. <laughs> Is that specifically for somebody who's sponsored, you know, who's sponsored no. by Vicolo Vulture on the Miami Heat? Anybody specific? Perhaps, perhaps. This is for Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy and everybody on the Miami Heat team. I give you that. Who, I give you where, that. Cheers to that, bro. <laughs> I give oh, you that. Oh, my goodness. Dude, you know what's so funny is that doing one of these things so late, I thought, you know, like, oh, man, you know, it's been kind of a long day. I'm going to be kind of, like, sleepy by the time we start this thing. And then the second win just came with that ending. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Pumped, pumped you right up. I have to say one yeah. thing, though. I have to say one thing. And I am, if not, if, I mean, everybody should know this. I am a LeBron James fan. One of the biggest LeBron James fans in the That's history. That's because you look like him. Sometimes, I, yeah. Sometimes you say I look like him. But I think I'm prettier. But if this was LeBron James that that just happened to, the media would have ate him up. They better eat up Giannis just the way that they eat up LeBron James if Giannis is that great. But... All I'm going to say is the media loves to eat goats, but they don't like to eat Greek. So that's none of my, that's no, none of my business. No, they, don't like, they don't like that diet. <laughs> they don't like that diet. They don't like that diet because he's oh, not a goat. Oh, my goodness. Man. But none of my, none of my, none of my business. But anyways, uh, congrats to the Miami Heat on that one. Yeah. They're up 2-0 on the, the Miami, I mean, on the Milwaukee Bucks. And I think they're going to go all the way. And maybe they might sweep. They might have to bring out the broom. You just might. You know, I will say this in relation to mixed martial arts. Honestly, the officiating of that game, I felt like it was perhaps done by the UFC judges in these past recent matches because, my God, my God. And like, it, it, I mean, and we've talked about that so many times in these episodes about just how the officiating, not the officiating, the decision-making by the judges in the UFC fights uh, recently have just been rather skewed. And we might even just go to that. I mean, I know he's your boy. But Frankie Edgar, right, right off the bat. I That's mean, right. I, I don't know. Like, I, I'm glad he he won. I think he did enough to to perhaps, you know, obviously, you know, convince people that he won. But I felt that was a toss up. I didn't necessarily felt feel convinced that like, wow, he won that fight. Um, I, I I'm not necessarily upset about the result. But I mean, yeah. What what were your thoughts? Yeah, if you guys don't know, two weeks ago, Frankie Edgar defeated. Made his uh, bantamweight, 135-pound de uh, debut. He used to fight at 155 when he was a champion, 145. He fought for the belt, and now he dropped down to 135. And he made his bantamweight debut, uh, defeating Pedro Munoz, who was a number five ranked ba uh, bantamweight, by split decision. Yeah, by split decision. And everyone was kind of just like, eh, I don't know. I think Pedro kind of won that. But they weren't upset that Frankie won it either because Frankie just, in my opinion, just knows how to win fights. He got those takedowns. Yeah. He got specific little movements at specific uh, strikes. I think the strike numbers were pretty close. Pedro may have been doing more of the damage because he hits harder. Frankie mm -hmm. Edgar is not known as the hardest hitter, but he's going to keep hitting you. Pedro's face was a little busted up for sure, but yeah. Frankie was winning the rounds. The specific rounds he was winning, I gave Frankie rounds two, four, and the fifth, and the fifth round, especially with the takedowns. If Pedro wants to complain about it, then don't, take, don't get taken down. You know, it's as, it's as simple yeah. as that. I know Frankie didn't do that much with the takedowns, but still, he got them, he scored points, and that's how he won that decision. Well, ultimately, that was the difference between the two of them was because the, the total strikes and significant strikes were rather close, but the two takedowns, obviously, that's, that's what... And I also think it was his confidence, the way that yeah. he conveyed himself from the beginning of the fight to the end of the fight. Sometimes when you don't perform at your best, just having that, uh, that confidence exuding is what's going to be able uh, it's going to it's just what's going to be enough to convince the judges that you won that fight. So good for him and I'm glad to see that he did win because I'm sure that if he lost everybody was going to be talking about oh when are you going to retire or you're going to hang it up finally this weight division doesn't work out for you or you're going to go back or whatever. So I'm glad to, uh, that he won and that he's going to be able to you know who knows perhaps go further on in this division. Yeah, and he's a he's a big name uh, in any weight class that he goes to because you know he's a former champion. A lot of people watch his fights. He has a lot of classic fights under his name, and he beats a number five ring fighter at the age of thirty eight. He's thirty eight years yep. old, fighting and still keeping up pace, fighting five round fights. There's guys who are not even taking five round fights because they're like, oh, I'm not prepared for it. Oh, I don't train like that. No, Frankie Edgar's yeah. taking those kind of fights at his age, and. 
he's excelling and he's winning the fight. So <clears throat> now he's number five in the bantamweight division. Now he just went from not being ranked at all to boom to number five. Now he's yeah. in the top five, and he's in he's in the top five with a name, which makes a difference because mm-hmm. just like a a Darren Till who was number seven or eight, like he snuck in there, was fighting a number one Robert Whitaker just off his name. So I think next for Frankie, in my opinion, and this is something that would be like maybe a long time coming or a fight that should have happened a long time ago if Frankie Edgar was fighting in the correct division because he's always been the mm-hmm. small guy and, right. and fighting all these huge guys, which is I give him so much credit for, is Dominic Cruz. Frankie Edgar against Dominic Cruz would be a dream fight, especially yeah. in this time period. These are two guys who have really good footwork, who like to move around a lot. Would it probably – probably a fight that would end up going to decision f- five rounds. I don't think I want to see a three round. I want to see five rounds because – these are guys who get hot later on in the in the fight. Yeah, Dom, exactly. Dom is just coming off that loss to, to uh, Henry Cejudo. Frankie is coming off the win, but at the same time, Dom is ranked higher than him, and Dom has only has what three losses in the bantamweight division. I think that's a perfect fight to to have, and maybe that becomes the number one contender in the weight class. Yeah, maybe. I mean, that that would be a good fight to uh, to see. I mean, I was thinking somebody like Jimmy or Asun Sao coming off that uh, that loss against uh, Cody Garbrandt. But yeah, I, I mean, if Dominic. He's okay, Cruz, if he's okay, <laughs> yeah, if he's okay. But I'm sure he's fine by now. I mean, I think that was like two or three months ago. But Ooh. I mean, then again, there was quite a punch. But yeah, no, that, that definitely would be a cool fight. You know, to see somebody uh, like Dominic Cruz go against um, Frankie Edgar. You know, uh, I think I think that would be an appetizing fight for them to to have next. Because even though Dominic lost, I mean, you know, he's still a great fighter, and and I think it, this would be definitely a great redemption fight for him fighting somebody as experienced and um, just as much as he is and, um, and as popular as Frankie Edgar. Absolutely. And now we have, um, finally, Dana White has confirmed Aljamain Sterling, speaking of the Bantamweight division, yeah. uh, Aljamain Sterling is officially the number one contender to fight Peter Yan for the 135-pound title. It took Dana White so long to confirm this. I think he was waiting for the Frankie Edgar fight to happen to see if Frankie did something crazy and kind of slide him in there or something because, you know, the UFC at the end of the day is a business. And, yeah. you know, they're going to go off names. And I guess Aljamain Sterling doesn't have the biggest name, but he's done everything he needed to do to get that title shot. And I'm not sure why it took Dana White that long. I mean, I have a couple things in my mind, <laughs> but I'm not going to dive. Uh, I'm not going to speculate. I'm not going to speculate, but Aljamain has the title shot now. And I think he'll fight Peter Yan probably in like a December. I don't think Peter Yan is injured. I don't think Aljamain is injured. So mm-hmm. they've been announcing a lot of fights for December, and I think that'll be one of them. How do you feel about that fight? And how, how do you feel about Aljamain finally getting that title shot? Well, I mean, we've been saying it now since his last fight against Cody Sanhagen. I mean, he's, he's deserving of everybody in that, in that uh, weight class to, to be the one. If anything, we actually, before Peter Yan and Josie Aldo uh, fought, we talked about Aljamain, uh, Aljamain fighting somebody else for that title. We didn't know necessarily who, but, you know, he's definitely the guy that should be fighting for that belt in the division. And I'm glad that he's finally, like, it's finally out there. At least it's not concrete, set in stone with a date. But I'm glad that Dana White has finally just, you know, confirmed that, hey, this is the, the next guy to come after Peter Young's belt. And he, he deserves it, man. And honestly, I think that he can beat Peter Young. And I, I, and I don't mean to make such an early prediction, and I'm not trying to be a fanboy. But, I mean, we talked about it ourselves. Like, the reason why we wanted to see him go for a title fight was because – we felt that he was just that much better than Peter Jan and Josie Aldo at this point of his career. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm excited about that. I think that he, he can definitely win. I would love for that to be the same card as the Usman Burns fight, which I believe yes. now is December 12th. Yes. I think that, and I think that would make most sense, especially because like you were talking about like how Sterling doesn't really bring in people. This would be the perfect opportunity to really build up his fan base and, uh, and let people know, hey, this is going to be the guy in this weight division for quite some time. Yeah, and I think he's very, like, I don't understand what the, the UFC doesn't see behind him, like, being marketable. I guess he doesn't market yeah. himself that much, but he's somebody that they can mark. He is a, he's black. Let's be honest, he's black. He's Jamaican. <laughs> he's got the gold, he's got the gold chain. He's got the braids. He's got the high yeah, top. exactly. There's not that many people, you know, that Who has look that like, fl- have yeah. that fl- flavor, you know, that fuck matcher mm-hmm. flavor. That, that, that they that, that flair that they can, you know, put out there. But I don't know. UFC makes their decisions in whatever way that they do and whatever they feel that they can push. But I think Aljamain would be a great guy to push, even over Peter Yan, because Peter Yan is still as good as Peter Yan is. I don't think he's the most marketable guy. He speaks no. English, at least, you know. That's something, because mm-hmm. not all these guys speak English. But I don't know. It's it's going to be 
it's, it shouldn't be too hard for the UFC to push a guy like Al Jermaine. But um, speaking of contenders, we had uh, this past weekend Alexander Rakic uh, take on yeah. Anthony Smith. The fifth-ranked Anthony Smith t- uh, take on the eighth-ranked Alexander Rakic. Um, it wasn't the most exciting fight. It was a no. three-round main event. Uh, Rakic, I believe, didn't want to go five rounds. So they chose to do three rounds, which is unfortunate. I don't know how much would have changed in five rounds. Uh, mm-hmm. Anthony Smith looked like he got overpowered. He looked like he probably shouldn't be fighting in a weight class, which is crazy because he's beaten so many top-ranked guys in the light heavyweight division. And now these guys are just huge, overpowering him, holding him down, and he just looked defeated in there. Yeah, it was it was a really um, boring fight, you know. And, and, and for some people, you know, it's entertaining for them to see, you know, one guy just bashing – the other one girl bashing the other constantly, but I like a back and forth type of fight. And, um, and this just wasn't one of them and, and neither was his last one against uh, Glover either. So it kind of makes me question what's going to happen next with him. Is he going to move uh, to another weight class or should he really just sort of, in my opinion, I think that he should sort of sit some time out if he can, of course, um, you know, sit some time out, you know, just get your head right, figure out exactly uh, what's wrong, work out the kinks and and get back into it but i think there's there's something definitely there whether it's the weight class or his mental game i don't know exactly what it is i don't want to you know assume the situation but yeah it's it's weird like i mean i mean alexander just absolutely dominated him and 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 i guess he dominated him so much that he even had the confidence to call out jan after or yeah not just jan but the the winner between jan and, <laughs> and Reyes, and, uh, and Reyes, you know, I think he mainly wants, uh, I think he wants uh, Blakovic because, uh, you know, maybe because of that whole, you know, Eastern Euro- uh, European uh, ties. <laughs> yeah, that'd, be, that'd be pretty cool. That'd be entertaining <laughs> for us. And I, I'm sure that'd be a better story for Dana White and the UFC. But, um, but yeah, man, I don't know what's, what's necessarily happened to Lionheart. And that's not to say that he's a quitter or that he doesn't have it anymore. It's just that obviously there's something there that's, that, that's blocking him from, from being the fighter that he used to be. Yeah, Rakic, he looked he looked good, but he didn't look great. There was he didn't yeah. really go for any finishes. It's kinda of like he was trying to just like, you know what, let me ride his decision out. And Anthony Smith is a kind is a hard guy to finish, so I understand that. But he did what he had to do to win. Does that give him the next title shot? I don't think so. There's guys in front of him and there's a guy named Anthony Johnson who's gonna come and like with some fire and some flames, and that would be a perfect intro yeah. for Anthony Johnson to find a guy like Rakic. And I don't see Rakic taking Anthony Johnson down and Rakic would be – it would be hard for him to take shots from Anthony Johnson. So I feel like that would be a perfect fight for Rakic next. And as far as Anthony Smith goes, I really feel like he should go back down to middleweight uh, where he was before. Uh, I don't think the, the weight cut is hard for him. He walks around at 206 pounds. That's mm-hmm. you, that's regular weight for a middleweight. Like Luke yeah, Rockwell exactly. is a guy that walks around at 215 pounds, and he makes 185. So I think Anthony Smith should just cut that weight. Go back to 185, kind of feel like a bigger, the bigger man because he's clearly struggling with the 205 guys, and they don't get smaller yeah. as you get higher. Dominic no. Reyes is a 6'4 guy. Uh, Blackwitch is a 6'3 guy. Just you get bigger and bigger with the guys that mm-hmm. as you go, you go higher and higher, and these guys are walking around way heavier, and they can hold them down, and that's the thing. He kept saying, I feel like I couldn't get up. I couldn't get up. Yeah. And, he's a pretty good, and he's a pretty good grappler. Anthony Smith is a very good grappler. And yeah, he, is. he looked like he was struggling really bad with Rackage. But – um. Yeah, it should be interesting to see what he does. And I agree. I think he should take some time off because he has had some brutal fights this year. Three fights that he had this year have been yeah. just like, my God, man, like the damage that he's taken. So I, I know he likes to come back pretty fast, but take time. Spend time with your kids. Uh, this year's already been weird enough. Like, yeah, you, you exactly. don't know. You have to keep spending all this time away, as you spoke before, from your family because you have to be somewhere two weeks ahead of time or mm-hmm. be away from them because you're in a gym with other people. Just take that time away. Spend it with your family. Ride the year out. He's made plenty of money this year. Next year, you come back strong. January, middleweight, they give you somebody in that top 10. Maybe give him an Edmund Shabazian. Why not? You know, there's so many people in that, that weight class that he can fight. And I think we see yeah. Anthony Smith back next year at middleweight. Yeah, definitely. I think that's the, that's the way to go. And, and it's true. Like, you've already had so many fights. Obviously, they've gone poorly. Um, but in the, in, the, in the sense that you've, you know, you've made enough income to, you know, I suppose, you know, just write the rest of the year off. Spend some time with your family. Sometimes that family time or that off time, it gives you just the absolute clarity to, to figure out what's going on and, and, and pinpoint what you need to focus on. So some, uh, what happens is that I feel a lot of times I'm struggling at something. 
is that they focus so much on it that they lose an outside perspective, yeah. you know, uh, because it's almost like they just have these blinders on. So, so I think, um, I think, yeah, definitely time off for him would be what, what would be best. Absolutely. And in the COVID event of Dakar this past weekend, we had the I think I'm losing you for a second. Hello? Yeah, I, th Jim? I think your 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 video is a little a little off. Is, is it off right? Not yet, not yet. Not yet? Okay. Yep. Connection's still a little weird. You know how IG Live is. Okay, now now I can hear you. Okay, yeah, yeah. Now I can hear you. I, I just wanted to, yeah, the audio is fine now. I, I know that the video doesn't really necessarily matter, but I just wanted to make sure that, you... no, 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 I hear you, I hear you much better now. The video is lagging, but whatever, the, the, the audio is back where it needs to be. Or maybe not. You can always count on IG too. All right, yeah, now, you, now you're good. Now you're good. I think. Ah, uh, yeah, that's all right. I know how this IG live goes. You sound good. Yeah, you sound good right now. Spit some fire. Yeah, I mean. All right, perfect. I hear you great. Yeah. It's in so poor connection. Shit. Oh, my connection's so it's good. Still, right it's now. still lagging, yeah. yeah. It's still, it's lagging, still lagging, right? Damn it. Hold on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn yeah, it off. Bit. I'm going to turn it off, and we'll just start from that halfway point. Wait, but you're, you're, actually, you're actually good right now. Now my I actually see you, and, I, and your video is good, and, and your voice is good right now. So, so you're not, my voice is not lagging anymore? A little bit, but, but, but like, at least I can it's hear better. it clearly. No, it's not, it's not digitized. It's yeah. better now. It's better now because I can see that we're talking perfectly. Before I, you had to okay, wait. Okay, yeah. I saw you waiting, and I'm just like, oh yeah. my god. Sorry, guys, for that technical difficulties. We have this on Inst on IG Live. You know what? I promise this is good. This is the last time. This Sorry. is the last time it's happening. We are officially moving because I can't have this happen anymore. But it's okay. Yeah. We carry on and we move on. As I was yeah. saying, uh, the Haitian sensation Neil Magny took on a former welterweight champion Robbie Lawler and defeated him by unanimous decision. The fight was not close. He had scores across the board, 30-26. He had that range. He used his range so perfectly. It's like Robbie Lawler was waiting for the fight to start, and he just had no engine to go, uh, which is so weird to see Robbie Lawler at that, uh, I guess, at that age because he's on the older side. Well, he's not even that much on the older mm -hmm. side. He's just been fighting for such no, a long not, time. Not really. Yeah, so it makes it seem yeah. that he's that old, but he's not even that old. He's just been fighting a long time, and I feel like it showed in that fight. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and, 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 you know, I don't want to necessarily rain down on him too hard because he, he, he was fighting against Neil Magny and Magny has definitely been on the rise. Um, even though it doesn't seem like it because he's not the most entertaining fighter, although this has to be, uh, at least from the fights that I've seen, the most entertaining fight he's had. Um, but yeah, I think it's what you're, you know, basically, you know, sort of insinuating is that, you know, he's been fighting for such a long time that it's kind of like, it's almost exhausting at one point. It's like, is this really necessary to go through with this? Like, or, or to keep on going, you know, like beating a dead horse. So, so I mean, I, I mean, that's what happened. And, and I don't want to necessarily say that's the reason why Neil shined in this fight. I think what happened for Neil's case is that, you know, he knows he's not the most, even though he gets the results, he's not the most entertaining fighter. And I, I suppose that he wants to show that, that, you know, that's not necessarily the case for him. He, he wants to show that he is the Haitian sensation and that he brings a lot to the table and he brings a lot of entertainment. 
And, you know, like I said, there's a lot of people that might not be entertained by that type of fighting, but I mean, somebody who can hold the fight and control it from the beginning to the end, um, that can be entertaining in, in its own way as well. So I'm happy that he got the win and that he's continuing to do that rise. I am a little heartbroken because Robbie Lawler is one of my favorite fighters. He was, you know, one, uh, it was my favorite fight between him and McDonald ever for, uh, as far as UFC fights. Um, so I'm kind of sad to, to see that he had that type of performance. I don't know if this is necessarily the end of him or near the end of him. Um, but if it is, I don't think it's because of a skill set as much as it is him just being drained from all this time that he's been fighting. Yeah, I just might be catching up. All the wars that he's had, uh, he just looked a little slow and he wasn't really like throwing the shots as hard as he used to. But it's more, you know, we got to give kudos to Neil Magny for putting on such a great performance. Yeah. I know it wasn't the most exciting performance, but that's not how he fights. And he is now two fights away from having the most welterweight wins in UFC history. He's going to be go, go past George St. Pierre. And That's George St. Pierre was a, was a champion for years. So that would be a cool accomplishment for him to have. Um, yeah. Also, you Neil know, Magni, I have to say, took you a little bit too long to talk about your Haitian heritage. But I appreciate it. And that makes me happy that you are putting that out there at the end of the fight. You said, Sac Passe, my ICNs. I appreciate that, Neil Magni. Put that out there, man. Because, you know, we need yeah, more man. people like you to speak about your heritage because it's very important. It's very, very yeah, important. Man. But... Now he moves up in uh, – I don't think he – yeah, he did move up in the ranks a little bit, like two mm – -hmm. uh, I think about two spots. And he was originally supposed to fight uh, Jeff Neal, who's ranked below him, but I think it would, it would still be a really good fight. But Jeff just dealt with a lot of medical issues, and I don't think he should be fighting anytime soon because they still didn't know what happened to him. And his heart almost mm -hmm. stopped, which was a little scary. So I think yeah. Jeff, Jeff takes some time off, and Neal fights somebody above him in that welterweight division. And we got a guy in uh, – Santiago, uh, Pan no, no, not Santiago Pan uh, Panzani. He already, he already beat. I mean, he already lost to him. Um, Vincente Luque, that I okay, feel yeah. like would be a really good fight. Uh, Vincente Luque has beat Nico Price this past year, and who else did he? He knocked out Randy Brown as well this year too. And I think that would be a pretty good fight. Vincente, Vincente Luque is good everywhere, just like Neil Magny is. And Luque could take Neil Magny down, who has a, an issue when he's on the ground, so it can give Magny a chance to prove himself. And he keeps saying, oh, I'll fight anybody, I'll fight anybody. Listen, Neil Magny, no more I'll fight anybody. You, ha you have almost the most wins in the welterweight division. You need to be fighting up to keep going up and get a title yeah. shot. You should not have that many wins in that division and not have a title shot or be somewhere spoken about to fight for the title. Yeah, enough with this humble pie nonsense, you know? No like, more. obviously, you know, call people out. We, uh, you know, we understand you'll fight anybody, but let's, let's hear some names. Um, because, I mean, honestly, this guy... Like I said, he's not the most entertaining fighter, but he, he's proven, obviously, with his record that he could beat anybody. So, you know, like, I, I would like to see, um, I would like to see a, a bit more, more, how should I say this, more involvement with UFC as far as getting his next fighter, you know, perhaps getting somebody in the top 10. I know that, that Vicente is, uh, is, is basically number 10, but I'd like to see him go beyond that, you know, um, because... I mean, it's, it's the, the thing I love about Neil Magny is that it's the quiet ones that you need to worry about. Yeah. Here's a guy that not a lot of people know about, and yet they should because, like you said, of his records. I mean, the only person that, uh, that has not beat with that is GSP, and, and, and I mean, that's, that's pretty big, you know? It's almost, <laughs> it's almost like I feel like a Tim Duncan type of, you know, uh, yeah, reference. Where fundamentals. You have like a, yeah, exactly, where, where it's almost like, you know, everybody's looking at the Kobe Bryants and the Michael Jordans and everything like that, and Tim Duncan's just there kind of in the corner with his five you know, finals, trophies, and everything like that. So that's what I want to see from Neil Magny. You know, I appreciate, you know, the, the humbleness and everything like that. But, I mean, at the same time, you know, own up to it, man. Like, you, you, you can. You've, you've obviously proven that you can. I mean, you don't have to be out there all Connor and everything and calling people's, no. you know, wives, towels, and things like that. You know, like going, like exactly being that disrespectful and crossing yeah. those type of lines. But, you know, you can go ahead and call people out by their name and let them know, that, like, look, it's it's no disrespect. I just think that I'm at your level, or if not more, and I want and and I can beat you. Absolutely. So let's see Neil like call somebody out after that because we got to see you fight in that top five and fight for a title maybe one day. But sticking in the welterweight division, let's stay there for a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Jorge Masvidal was seen training with Tyron Woodley down in St. Louis, and I kind of saw this about like three weeks ago. I saw Masvidal randomly in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm like, he can't be making yeah. an appearance. There's no appearance making right now. There's no fans to see anybody. 
what's he doing there? He's not. He's there's no. Uh, his mezcal is definitely not made there. Yeah, exactly. So just like, what is he doing? I'm like, is he helping out Tyron Woodley to fight Kobe Covington? And what do you know? Tyron Woodley dropped a video yesterday, and it's uh, Jorge Masvidal. Was that yesterday or was yeah. that today? I think I don't know. I don't know what today. I is. don't We're know. Still in February, man. It doesn't matter exactly. February twenty yeah. second. But um, yeah, the Tyron Woodley drops a video, and Jorge Masvidal is training with him in St. Louis, and he has been for the past three weeks, and he'll be there yep. for the next two weeks, helping him train for Colby Covington. Nick, give me your thoughts on that. What's no, I mean, uh, it's it's a uh, it's an awesome situation for him, right? I mean, Jorge and, and Kobe used uh, Kobe, um, ha, uh, uh, were were teammates before, so you know it's um, it's almost like you know you're getting insider information with this and how it's going to work out. So and and obviously these are two guys that I mean not a lot of people like Kobe Covington, um, but I mean these are two guys that uh, specifically have an animosity towards him, have a a, a clear. Um, disrespect between the two of them and the, uh, or, or the three of them, I guess you could say, um, that they just don't like one another. So I feel that, you know, if Jorge can help Tywan Woodley shut up Kobe Covington, I mean, he's, it's almost for him, it's almost like it's going to be a win in his column as well. You know, because it's, it's just that personal. Agreed. And, and I know some people are looking at it just like, why are you going to have a guy like Jorge like, help you fight a wrestler like Kobe Covington? They've trained together for a majority of their MMA careers. Yep. It is perfect. Jorge knows majority everything that Colby Covington does. They literally trained as far as last year before they started beefing. They still were training at ATT together. Now, yeah. Colby Covington is no longer at American Top Team. Apparently, now he's training at MMA Masters, who has always been like a rival gym of American Top Team down here in Miami. Mm -hmm. And Tyrone found that out, too. And I feel like that's a perfect person for Tyrone to pick up and it's going to motivate him. He said Jorge's on top of him when he's just like, where's the weight at? Where's this? Okay, let's get back in here. And it's almost like, yeah. I want to say coaching him, but it's just like, it's good to have somebody who's just as motivated as you in your camp because Tyrone doesn't really have that because he trains by himself. Not by himself, but just like with not guys like that in his right, camp. Exactly. You know, he'll have the yeah. coaches, but like the body wise, you know, you can't be with Ben Askren every single time and think you're going to win every get, get, have like the greatest result. Not to, No disrespect yeah. to Ben Askren, but just like He's not fighting anymore. He's right. not as motivated as uh, Jorge Masvidal is as motivated now because Masvidal lost that fight to Usman. He will do everything and anything to get back to that fight against Usman and to mm -hmm. help somebody else beat somebody that he doesn't like. So it yeah, was, exactly. just, like, just like you said, it'd be a win for both of them. And yeah. speaking of uh, Masvidal, we're apparently uh, uh, announced yesterday we are going to be getting the BMF title fight part two. Jorge Masvidal will be taking on Nate Diaz Again, uh, either uh, late December or early January, uh, Masvidal said he kept his word. He told Nate Diaz after the, the fight that, nah, man, I'm going to give you a rematch, you know, after the cut because I guess he wanted to finish him. And, of course, Nate Diaz is a big is a guy who wants fights that are just big money, and he accepted yeah. that immediately. Um, do I want to see this fight? I'll watch it. I'm not going to say I'm not going to watch that fight. No, but was exactly. that the fight that I wanted to see? No, because we got yeah. Leon Edwards waiting there in the ranks just to fight who? Like, why not just put there, Jorge twiddling his thumbs. Yeah, twiddling his thumbs. He, po he posted something today just like him in the yard, just like waiting to play. Like, I, I, yeah. I, 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 I <laughs> it's feel like that him at this point. Me. Yeah, I feel him at this point. Like, I get it, Jorge Masvidal. You want big money fights, but, like, now you are, a, a, you are the A-side. No matter who you fight, people are going to watch. So yeah. you have a, a good uh, history with Leon Edwards. They can post the three-piece in a soda clip, and everybody's going to want to watch that, that fight. Why yeah. Why not fight Leon Edwards? But that's out of my hands. That's the UFC. Nick, will you be watching the BMF title fight part two? I mean, of course, because I'm a Miami guy, so I'm going to support <laughs> anything Miami, you know? Like, I'm going to – well, not anything, but, you know, most things Miami, you know? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support it because – and, and I, this isn't necessarily the fight that I wanted to see right off the bat against, you know, Kamar Stuzman, but – um, oh, oh, wow. They like that? That's a call out. <laughs> they like that, right? Well, because I mean, like, we all kind of like, I mean, maybe not us because I was emotionally invested in stuff like that. And it's premature for us to actually expect Masvidal to be able to beat uh, Kamar Usman on six days notice. And I'm not, not only that, but a six days notice on an international flight halfway around the world and everything like that. Um, so I think this fight is probably best for him. I know that he got a new agreement when he decided to fight Usman with, uh, with UFC. And I'm sure that they're going to want to, um, obviously, they're going to want to, you know, get some 
you know, some big entertaining fights that people are going to want to see again. And uh, I don't think people like us are necessarily, necessarily want to uh, tune in, but you know, Nate Diaz has a big following and so does Jorge Masvidal. So you give them that rematch, especially the fact that the fight was called off early last time, you know, people want to see, you know, these guys finish each other off because these guys are straight up gangsters, you know, like, and, and, you know, kind of sort of to reiterate what, what we, what we were talking about before with, you know, him not training with Tyron Woodley, that's why he's so much more invested uh, compared to somebody like you said, like a Ben Aspen, because he has that gangsterness in him that he just wants to end people. It's not like a, it's not like a friendly, like, oh, this is just, you're a professional, I'm a professional, let's see this thing out. Like, no, I want to end you in any physical possible way. And that's exactly who Jorge Masvidal is, and that's exactly who Nate Diaz is. So it's still going to be an entertaining fight. I, I wanted Leon Edwards, but I think that Leon Edwards will come after this. And not only that, but you also perhaps don't want to risk, especially having given Jorge Masvidal this, this, new, this new contract. You don't want to risk him going into it with Leon Edwards and perhaps losing that fight, right? Not to say that Nate Diaz is, gonna, is an automatic write-off, because yeah. he's not. He's a tough son of a bitch. But, right. Um, right. but, you know, like, let's say it's more, I guess you could say, statistically speaking or probable that, you know, Jorge gets out of this, especially with all the, the, um, the heat that he's packing with him right now. And that he's got this, this big following behind him, whereas Nate Diaz's following is probably like on the decline, um, or at least not as aware as, as before. So um, I, think, I think this was the right move. Uh, I think that they get, this fight goes through. Perhaps uh, Jorge, uh, you know, he gets he gets this experience and then he moves on to Leon Edwards and then that's the experience he needed right before instead of jumping right in. Yeah, uh, it's crazy to see. Wait, well, I, well, I agree with you. With the Nate Diaz, not a he's a write off. You know, that's gonna be a tough fight. For yeah, anybody. no, it's not. One hundred percent, it's gonna be a tough fight for anybody. I just feel Jorge Masvidal is better than him every everywhere, and we saw that in the last fight. Um, mm-hmm. It's just crazy to me that Leon Edwards is on an eight fight winning streak and hasn't fought since July of last year. That yeah. makes no sense to me. I mean, I get it. He was supposed to fight March 21st against Tyron Woodley, but why is the UFC not working hard to get him a fight? I don't get it. There until is from the same place as, as, as uh, uh, Leon Edwards from the UK, and they got yeah. him to fight at Fight Island. So why can't they get Leon Edwards on one of these cards? What is, what is going on? I don't understand what the difficulty is there. And there's a lot of guys for him to fight, even that's not Jorge Masvidal. Yeah, but, they're exactly. not putting, but they're not putting him in there, in, in there with that. I don't understand that. I think it's a weird thing. And I, I think hopefully uh, Leon Edwards gets a fight by the end of the year. I hope so. Before the end of the year. I, 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 if, even if it's not anybody in the top five, somebody in the top seven, top eight, give him a fight. Neil Magny, you want, you want to fight Leon Edwards? Put him in there with, with, with Leon Edwards. That, that, you know what? That I'd like a, to see. That's a pretty good fight. That's a really good fight. You, so, want, to, you want to talk about a test for Neil Magny? My God, that's that's perfect. Yeah. Neil Magny beats him. Oh, you put Holy him up there shit, too. Yeah. And Neil Magny has done a wonderful job with strikers. So, like, I don't think it would be yeah, a big exactly. issue for him. He's only struggled with grapplers. So now you get a guy mm-hmm. who's definitely not going to take you down. Come on, let's let's see that. But do it. I don't know. UFC is on some weird stuff with with matchmaking. But speaking of some weird things, Brock Lesnar is officially a free agent. Uh, he had he did not resign yeah. with the WWE. Um, is he going to the UFC? Yeah. Yet, right? Yet. He has done this in the past before to where he's been a free agent and everybody speculates he's going to come back, he's going to come back, and then he ends up resigning with the WWE. Exactly. The only thing I feel is different in this time is that Brock Lesnar is a very expensive contract. The WWE mm-hmm. is in a, in a point to where they're not selling out arenas. They just have the show that they do, the Thunderdome in Orlando, Then they're mm-hmm. not traveling and they're only making money off streams and people watching and views and you know the other sales that they have. And you want to pay a guy like Brock Lesnar, who was basically getting a million dollars per appearance. That's a yeah. lot of money. It's a lot yeah, exactly. of money. And do they want to pay him that amount of money? Uh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how much he's worth at 43 years old wrestling in WWE. But the UFC, Dana White said it yesterday. He said, John Jones and Brock Lesnar wants to fight. He will make the fight. Yeah, Scott Coker of, of Bellator said, if, if Brock Lesnar wants to come to Bellator... Brock versus Fedor. That's the, the a fight we never got to see. No. He'll make that fight. He does have options, but at the end of the day, we never know what Brock Lesnar's going to do. He doesn't do media appearances. He doesn't speak. He does his no. things under wrap. So where do you think he's going to end up, Nick? Well, I think it's the same situation as Michael Chandler. You know, like the, uh, the, the possibilities are limitless. You know, people, yeah, we want, we want Chandler <laughs> in, in, in the UFC, but, you know, it, we still got to realize that there's still a possibility of him going back to Bellatory. Obviously, he's been happy there. Um, but that's Chandler. As far as Lesnar, I mean, I can't, 
I think this is another charade in the sense of like what he's done before, you know, like he's going to say like, oh, you know, I'm thinking about free agency. I'm thinking about free agency. Well, we all know that he probably was probably he's going to go back to WWE, especially at 43 years old. Why am I going to get, you know, kicked in the face and, and go through all this when it could just be, I'm sorry to break it to you guys. It's not real. WWE, it's kind of fixed. <laughs> I don't know if you know that yet, but, you know, like why not get guaranteed results? And no disrespect to Ronda Rousey, it was sort of the same thing. It's like, why am I going to get the shit kicked out of me every time I go in there? And now that especially that I'm not in my prime and take the, the risk of losing when really now I know when I'm going to win and I know when I'm going to lose. And, and not only that, but I'm going to get paid handsomely for it as well. So I think this could be, I would love to see a Lesnar and a John Jones fight, but I think that this is a situation where he goes to, to UFC, he gets an offer, then he goes back to WWE. He's like, look, this is what they gave me. What can you, what can you match or what can you do over kind of thing like that? So, I mean, I've just seen this movie before, so I'm not getting too excited <laughs> about it. Would I love it? Absolutely. But, I mean, come on. Come he's, on. A com- he's a competitive guy. That's the only thing that ever gives me some kind of, like, inkling, oh, maybe he's going to go and find the UFC. That's, he wants that title back. That's he wants to fight again, but... Once again, I'm not saying Brock Lesnar's on steroids, but last time that he fought and he came from the WWE, he tested positive or something. So yep. if he were to find the UFC, he'd have to join that USADA pool. Uh, yep. And then he'd have to be on it for six months, and he has to pass everyone, every single one of those tests. So yep. if he can do that after being with the WWE, because we know they're not the cleanest people. No offense. No. Sorry, Vince McMahon. You take steroids yourself. Uh, but I, but it's uh, fine. I mean, that's their whole point, is that this, I, isn't, I, this isn't a skill set. This is an yeah. entertainment aspect <laughs> Only. Oh, you know, I'm, you, not, I'm not going to disrespect. Yeah. The, I'm not going to disrespect uh, wrestlers because there is. I think there's a skill set because there's a lot. Oh of no, stuff there, they there have to is. Do. Right, of course. There's, yeah, there's, they have there's talent. The skill, but they it's have more talent. so entertainment. Yeah. Like this isn't the Oscar-nominated, yeah. you know, international <laughs> film. This is the you know explosions, popcorn, Fast and Furious, Twenty Seven. You know, planes. Uh, you know, cars jumping out of planes and things like that. That's what WWE is. So it's okay <laughs> to have these guys maybe perhaps taking a little something extra that they can't take in other you know, professional leagues, but whatever, that's fine. Now that's a true, uh, but that's true. Do you think that Brock Lesnar is going to want to go through all that cleanse and, and be at 43 years old, having to, to be natural and going into, to UFC to, to compete? I mean, at this point, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. I know he's competitive, but it's, it's a lot more demanding than it was before, but listen, in the words of Joe, uh, Brennan Schaub and Joe Rogan, sometimes on their podcast, when they're a little drunk, Give them all steroids. <laughs> Who cares? Give, <laughs> yeah, give them exactly. all steroids and let them fight. Who cares? Let's Why not? Right? Why not? But anyways, speaking exactly. of another comeback, we got Luke Rockhold uh, after yeah. a hiatus for about a year and a half now. Decided that he is coming back and he's coming back to the middle weight division. And something that's very interesting is that he's now training with Coach Jason Perillo, who was Michael Bisping's head coach when Michael Bisping knocked out Luke Rockhold. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Thought that that was going to be some kind of a drama, but uh, Coach Perillo came out and said Michael Bisping doesn't even care. Bisping said he doesn't even care either. Bisping did yeah. drop a couple comments about Luke Rockwell, but they've always had a long standing point of not liking each other. But yeah, mm-hmm. Rockwell's coming back to the uh, middleweight division. Who does he fight? Does he fight somebody in top 15 off the bat? Does he take his time? Maybe fight somebody a little bit, you know, give a warm up fight? Or mm-hmm. is that chin still there? What, do, what are we looking at with Luke Rockwell? Well, that chin's still there, and it's got titanium in it now. So uh, why not? That's <laughs> true. He didn't break his jaw. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so as long as he's not fighting Magneto, I think he'll be all right. You know, like so. Uh, but I mean, if as far as who's he gonna fight? Why not Weidman? Part two, right? We yeah, were part supposed two. We we're supposed why? to see that uh, three years ago. Yeah, exactly. Why not? And Weidman's getting back into it. You know, so I mean, uh, I think that would be the perfect fight for him to come back into, especially Weidman coming off his win now. Um, I think I think that would make the most sense out of all the opponents that that, that he would face uh, coming back into UFC. Yeah, and I feel like they're in similar points in their career to where yeah, like exactly this this fight would kind of tell you like where you are and if you can still defeat somebody exactly. at a certain a certain um what's the word I'm looking for just like in that in that uh, in that in those rankings. So mm-hmm. I would love to see uh, Rockwell versus Weidman. That would be great. That would be part two. They fought for the middleweight championship three years ago. Rockwell defeated Weidman by TKO. I'm sure Weidman would want to get that win back, which would, you know, kind of give him maybe more motivation and just, like, kind of spark him a spark in it, and maybe he'll start making that run after beating a Luke Rockhold. But just like you said, he's got titanium in that jaw now, so it would be a little harder to knock yeah, him out. Yeah, exactly, to knock him <laughs> out. Because that's the problem Luke Rockhold was having before. The chin would just not 
just giving him anything. And he would just get knocked out by Yoro Romero. He got knocked out by Michael Bisming. He got knocked out by Vitor Belfort. He got knocked out by John Blockowitz. I cut off there. Luke Rockwell yeah. is a guy who, um, who definitely like is is he talks about his stand up so much, but he's just so much better on the ground. So I hope when Luke Rockwell comes back, he shows that amazing ground game, that amazing jujitsu, that black belt that he has. Because every time he takes somebody down, he looks amazing there. So you yeah, should go back does. to that bread and butter and just like not even think of, think about this uh, uh, going back to the striking style. But um, speaking of condiments. We had a very salty Sean O'Malley uh, talk about <laughs> very uh, nice, nice touch. His, I like his, that. His his, uh, <laughs> his loss that Chico Vera. He finally came out and spoke about it and said, "I didn't lose that fight. I did not lose that fight. You guys might thought I lost that fight, but I don't think I lost it. I was out striking him, and he just hit a nerve in my leg, and I just couldn't move that leg anymore." Sean O'Malley, you clearly lost that fight. He kicked you in the right place. And you could not yeah. continue. You left the octagon on a stretcher, my guy. Listen, I'm not saying you gave up. You just, you just couldn't go anymore. Just I, I'm not saying you, you gave lost. up, but Cheeto Vero clearly won that fight. Give him yeah, his yeah. props and carry on because you're not going to look good making those comments. No, no. Especially with the fact that this wasn't a, a previous injury. You know, this wasn't like an injury that he had got, you know, walking to the ring or in the back while he was training or warming up. I mean, this, the reason why he has that injury is because of Chito. So yeah. you got to give credit to Chito. Chito won. I mean, yeah, he might have not been won. Uh, the way that, that, that you wanted him to win, but he won. And, and this is a loss. And if you don't think so, I mean, you're not the one that's having your arm raised at the end of the fight. So you lost. And, and, and it's okay. You know what? It's okay to lose. I know he's probably salty about it, like you said, because, of the, uh, because you know, it, it, it diminished his, uh, his record. You know, it, it took away that perfection. But it's okay, man. Like you, 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 like the, that old cliche, you win and you learn. You know, you don't necessarily lose. So you can come back and, and, and prove to Chito that, like, hey, you know what? You got away with it, but I'm going to get you back next time. But don't be adding these comments about that. Oh, no, I didn't lose that fight. It's like, dude, you lost the fight. Statistically and figuratively and physically, every aspect, you lost that fight. So don't make excuses. Just come back and show him that he got away with it or don't. But, you know, you got, you got to let your game do the talking. That's it. And, I, and you know what comment I hate the most that uh, some fighters make after a fight? Nine times out of ten, I would have beat him. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, one time out of one, you didn't beat him. So let's concentrate on what just happened and yeah, concentrate exactly. on maybe your next opponent or improving whatever, wherever you mm -hmm. just, like, took that, took that defeat. It's one loss, Sean O'Malley. It's literally one loss. I understand you're not the best with taking the L. But, like, yeah, you just have to take it, carry on, see who you can fight before the end of the year. You didn't break anything. You didn't fracture no. anything. Nothing was damaged. You carry on, get back in that gym, work on your game, learn how to defend a calf kick because you kept talking about how you kept throwing them. Okay, you know how to defend them mm -hmm. too because look what happened to you. You went down yeah, exactly. and you couldn't get up and those elbows were coming at your face and that has nothing to do with your legs. His, oh, the elbows were yeah, striking exactly. him in the face that has nothing to do with your legs. You're on the ground mm -hmm. now. Where's the jujitsu? Where's everything else? I'm not saying you don't have those skills, but like you can't blame it on other things. But yeah, exactly. Sugar Sean, hopefully we we'll see you uh, before the end of the year. Another fight. I don't know if they'll give you somebody ranked. He, he does have a big name. So I feel like the UFC will give him somebody ranked. But yeah. I want to see Cheeto fight somebody in the top 10. I hope Cheeto gets a lot of like recognition yeah, for should, what he just should, did. Man. Definitely. He's, He's, from, he's yeah. like one of the only fighters from Ecuador. Come on, man. Yeah, like, exactly. Push, push these guys, man. Push yeah, these man. guys. UFC. Not only that, but like, you know what? I, I mean, I hate to go with the old cliche, but excuses are like assholes, man. Everybody has them and they all stink. Yeah. So, <laughs> that just, so just move on from it. You lost. It's okay. You know, come back. You're a great fighter. You're probably the best fighter in that division. And, no, and, and not, maybe everybody doesn't see that yet, but, you know, he, he probably is. So you can, you can just come back and win, whether it's against Cheeto or one of these top 10 guys or top five guys. I think he has the ability to beat any of these guys. So when you have that skill set, you know, there's no sense in, you know, getting involved with the nonsense of excuses. Just, just move on, man. 100%. And if – oh, I lost my train of thought there. I had something really good. Sorry, um, sorry. No, I know. I had, something, I had something really good to say. Sorry. I literally yeah. – I forgot what I was going to say. But – Sugar Sean O'Malley, we'll see you before the end of the year. Cheeto, hopefully mm -hmm. they push you. You need that push. You're from Ecuador. You deserve that. 
Um, yeah. yeah, that's all, that's all I can say about that. It, it sucks. Oh, no, that's what I was going to say. Chris Lytle spoke about it today. Like, man, like when you're in there, it's nothing, it's nothing that you can train for. It's up here. It's the yeah, mental man. game. It mm-hmm. is the mental game. I know you Absolutely. have all the, the spark and the pizzazz and everything, but it is up here at the end of the day. And if you need to go to a sports psychologist, something like that, to like help him in those moments so where he gets injured, you know, he's, he's, he, 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 can, he can do that. And I, I've seen so many fighters fight with broken hands. Uriah Faber fought uh, Mike Brown with two broken hands and was throwing elbows for five rounds. Like, when you see performances like that, that shows Dude, big hearts of champions. I right mean, Thiago Santos <laughs> fought John Jones with no legs. No legs. With no legs. <laughs> Absolutely he, no he legs. He might as well have had his legs amputated for that fight. Yeah, well. literally. And he just, like, struggled. He struggled there and... It's unfortunate that he did, but mm-hmm. what what can you do? We're going to see Tiago Santos actually fight uh, next yeah. weekend against Glover mm-hmm. Teixeira. That's a good fight coming up. Yeah. We got Alistair Overeem and Augusto Brazil. Sakai coming uh, this Saturday. That's going to be a really good one. We got a lot of fights. We got so many things coming yeah. up. Contender Series on Tuesdays, if you guys ever want to watch that. So you got some up-and-comers. A lot of these guys came off the Contender Series, like Sean O'Malley, Jeff Neal. A lot of guys that you see fighting right now have come up on the the contender series, so that's really something really good to uh, to watch. Hopefully, we get Michael Chandler's announcement in the UFC. Praying for that one. I hope it happens. Um, if you guys, if you guys have a question right now, we got a minute. We'll answer it real quick. I know Junior, you're in here. If you guys want to ask a question, go well, ahead. I did want to add one thing. I just yeah, want to give ahead. a shout Absolutely. out. Um, you know, my favorite moment from this past weekend. Yeah, uh, I want to give a shout out to Ricardo Lamas. Oh yeah, uh, for his for his post fight comments, um, I really do appreciate him. You know, just shedding some national attention to the the oppression that happens in Cuba. I know a lot of people see it as this paradise and everything like that, but a lot of people are not necessarily educated on uh, you know the basic human right violations that that are still going on there to this day. So I'm glad that he that you know he he came out and there's a video of him essentially saying what he said in Spanish for, for non-Spanish speakers, but um, nonetheless, I just want to give him a shout-out because it, it definitely hit, uh, struck a nerve with me. Obviously, being Cuban-American, being a first-generation American, you know, carrying that borrowed pain from, from my parents, and, and I just I really appreciate him doing that. So thank you, Ricardo Lamas. I want you to continue spreading that message, educate people, and continue fighting, man. Don't retire. You're a great yeah. fighter. I don't, I don't want to see you hang up the gloves just yet. Yeah, he's got so much left in him. He's young, and I know he's had a, a, a long career. Not too long of a career. He's still yeah, got no. time in him. And, and sometimes, you know, you get super emotional, especially in this time period, being away from his family. He was down here in Miami training yeah. with his kids in Chicago because he's originally from Chicago. Right, and that's exactly. very That's very, very hard for, for somebody like that to do. And that's mm-hmm. the first time he spoke on a topic like that ever in his career, and we don't get to see yeah, Ricardo Lamas talk enough. And that's awesome that he got to bring a, 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 a yeah, topic like that up. Yeah, yeah, using using his platform because yeah. athletes have platforms that speak about things. Exactly, and just like man. NBA basketball players just had that mm-hmm. platform when they sat up on those yeah, games. Man. And anybody can say whatever they want. Oh, that's stupid. They should just play basketball. No, they yeah, exactly. have a platform and they are using it for what they believe in and for whatever that it is. I don't care what you I don't care what you believe in, but they're using right. the platform for something that they believe in and unfortunate things that are happening in this country. So for mm-hmm. anybody to say, oh, they should like just shut up and just keep like playing Kobe. the game and just like, yeah, no, there's, there's, there's no way, man. And that's, that's wild to me for yeah. me to hear that. And I hope that it inspires other athletes and other sports to do the same exact thing as the exactly, Marlins did in that game. Like that was, yeah. I did not expect the Marlins to do that. That was no, dude, un- I mean, but, unbelievable. But this is the thing, right? If you have a platform, technically we all have platforms, especially yeah. now, nowadays with everybody having social media, we yeah. all have platforms now. And you know what? It's your right and it's your belief to, if you find that there's, that there's, some, there's injustices going on, it's your right to speak out towards those injustices, to, to bring awareness to those injustices. Absolutely. So, you know, like, whatever it may be, like you said, like, you know, obviously, like, a lot of people might think that what Ricardo Lamas uh, is, is calling out for is, is necessarily anti um, the situation that we have with Black Lives Matter and the NBA stands for. It's not. It's, it's, it's just right versus wrong. It's, it's standing up towards oppression, standing up against uh, injustice. And there's really no problem. You as a person, as an individual at home, have your right to share your thoughts on it. So, so yeah. do these fighters, so do these athletes. You know, if, they have, if you have a platform, use it. Spread awareness, spread, educate people. And that's another thing too. Too many people nowadays are lo- looking for affirmation over information. 
you know, like and that's, yeah. that's what you need to do. You need to, it's okay to, you don't need to know everything. It's all right. It's, it's imperative now that we're, uh, especially after the year that we spent, um, you know, it's, it's, I feel it's imperative for people to be compassionate with one another. And that when somebody speaks, listen, don't just be listening to have the, uh, don't be hearing, you know, for, for a certain counterpoint that you can make after they finish their statement. You yeah. know, listen to their problems and try to understand, well, why does this person think that way? You know, and that's the only way that, that we're ever going to be able to solve these solutions or at least come close to solving them is when we share that compassion for one another and understanding. So don't point fingers. Don't say like, oh, of course, well, what do they know? They're living the life. They're millionaires and everything like that. You know, you people, know, everybody, it doesn't, matter, it doesn't yeah. matter how much money you have or how much little money you have. Everybody has problems and everybody deserves the right to be heard and everybody deserves the attention to address the, the things that are most important to them. Amen to that. I love that. And, and I agree wholeheartedly with that. And I even had, like, this past weekend, somebody asked me a question about, like, oh, do you, uh, do you agree with the whole Black Lives Matter thing? And I'm just like, yes, I do. And like, we do, can, do we you can, see my face? Right? Like, I you know, know? right? <laughs> we, can, we can sit here and we can have a conversation about it. And we sat right. there and we had a conversation about it because I can do that. I will have a conversation with you. I'm not going to say, yeah. oh, you asked me that question. You're stupid for even asking me that. No, yeah, exactly. I'm going to have this conversation about it and I'm going to tell you exactly what I feel that that message is and how I feel about it mm -hmm. and why it should be very put out there, you know? And we had yeah, that exactly. conversation. So there's never a, uh, a, a bad thing to have that conversation. I encourage people to have those awkward conversations because yeah, it's going to happen. We have to have them. Some people have never experienced things that everyone else has, has, has experienced before. Mm -hmm. So don't just judge over millions of dollars, like yeah. you just said, somebody being rich or just whatever it is. No, yeah. if, the, if someone feels a certain way about something, they are definitely open to, to speak about it. We live in a country to where freedom of speech, speak. You can't yeah, exactly. speak. And, but that's like you say, you said, you said, Nick, which I feel like is very important. There is a very huge difference between just right and wrong, like clear, right yeah, and exactly. wrong. When, when something happens, and I feel like we're mixing and getting confused and, not, and this affirmation yeah. and that information which is so important. And I encourage everybody right, to exactly. get your information from the right places, get your sources correct. Stop reading a random, don't get your sorry date, made in date. I'm not getting my news from you. Like I'll get my memes from you and you guys can yeah, make it exactly. but you're not gonna give me any news, that, uh, credible news that I'm gonna be looking forward to. Sorry right. to you guys. I rep the 305, you know, I love, I love the city that I live in, but I'm not getting my news from you. And I hope everybody right. does the same and get your news from credible places, credible sources. And let's just try to, be better human beings as the year goes by and try to help and not hurt because it mm -hmm. that's not going to solve anything you know any any more pain right, that exactly. we already have experienced this year which has been very tough and hard on everybody so yeah, yeah. let's 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 get let's get better and rest in peace to to chadwick boseman that was a big one. Oh my you know, god that, that yeah. one that man, one will crush Jesus. me further it's like Ugh, talk talk about Bozeman. not assuming people's uh, positions and, my, and, their, and their situation. Like, my God. Like, no, yeah, yeah. Nobody knew that. And I'm sure no. he was living his life to the fullest no matter what and didn't want to, like, say, say that to no, people. He wasn't having a pity party, you know? He's, no. not, he's, not having a pity. he's making an, a profound impact on, 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 on not just his culture but the world, you yeah. know? Like, so, so, I mean, that's the way you have to be, man. You can't assume what somebody's going through. You have to be compassionate because we all come from different walks of life yep. uh, for better or worse. And it's just best that, you know, we, we have these uncomfortable conversations because nothing great comes out of comfort zones, yeah. you know? So, so that's the only way we progress is by having these, these difficult conversations, but in doing so, learning about one another, understanding yep. each other, you yep. know, that's the only way we move forward. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. A hundred percent. R.I.P. Chadwick Bozeman. We miss you. Thank you so much for the memories of everything that you gave us uh, while you were here. Um, you are a fighter. You are very strong. I know it was probably super difficult for you to go through what you did, but you still per you persevered as long as you could. And, of course, we love and appreciate you forever. But on that note, we appreciate you guys for joining us on a late-night version of The Mystic Hour. It will be posted okay. on iTunes, Spotify, everywhere you listen to podcasts. Me and Nick here every week. I know we took a week off, but it's okay give you all that information today. We'll be back next week. We've got fights on Saturday, contender series next Tuesday, more fights on Saturday, basketball games, all this stuff. There's still sports. There's so much things. Please watch. Yeah. Thank you, guys. We're I was going to say, I'm going to hop oh. off now because I got I to get my, my broom to, to start sweeping. You know? Oh, start sweeping. <laughs> By the heat, hey, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Hey. All right, guys. We'll see you soon. The heat. <laughs>